you're going, Tiger. Meet Christopher Dale Flannery, hitman and multiple murderer. He turned killing into a business, creating Australia's own Murder Incorporated and earned the nickname rent -a -kill. Tonight, Australian Crime Stories examines the dark life of Christopher Dale Flannery, Australia's most notorious hitman. Through dramatised scenes, first-hand accounts and detailed analysis of Flannery's life, we will give a detailed portrait of the man who was believed to have killed 15 people on contract before his luck ran out and he disappeared, friendless, with ruthless enemies dispatched to kill him. His disappearance has remained a mystery for almost three decades, a coronial inquest lasting almost five years could not crack the case. On Australian Crime Stories tonight, we will identify who killed Chris Flannery. I mean, Flannery was the only person I've ever heard of that, that ran around saying, oh, I'm going to kill people for money. I don't drop my price for nobody. Get it? I am a hitman. Call me a rent -a kill Flannery's reputation was that he was a, a psychopathic rat bag. I saw him break a guy's teeth with a muzzle of a gun and I was sure he was going to shoot him right then and there. Hey, Chris! Hey, no! Please. Come on! The job was this person had to die. They brought uh, Christopher Dale Flannery up to uh, do away with me. Chris Flannery was the person who shot me at my house that evening. When we think of Australian identities in crime, the name Christopher Dale Flannery looms large. His name and reputation as a hitman spread fear through the Australian underworld of the 1970s and 80s. Renter Kill's price was 50,000, and for that, he bragged, anyone could be eliminated. However, Flannery was also a committed family man. Between murders, he took time out to dote on his kids and his wife, Kathleen. This was a man with a long history of criminal activity. But until the contract killing of businessman Roger Wilson in February 1980, Flannery had stayed off the media radar. Mr Wilson was last seen here at the factory premises at the corner of Currajong Street and Robs Road in Footscray on Friday night. He was working late with other company executives evaluating a new product. He is said to have been very enthused by the product and was in high spirits. Well, Roger Wilson was a clean skin. Had no background in crime. He was a barrister turned businessman who got caught up with the wrong sort of investors. The investors were criminals and they wanted their money. But the investments went bad, they didn't get their money, and they figured it was just retribution. I'd take this bloke out and kill him. And that's what Flannery was asked to do. I remember him telling me about um, the art of killing. He knew all about bodies and what hurt and, and where to hurt them in the shortest possible time. And um, he said, the only thing about this game, Craig, is the fucking noise. And I said, there's got to be more things that worry you than the noise. And he goes, yeah, not getting paid. Renekill Inc. was a murder for hire business. Chris Flannery was its principal operator, but there were other men, associates of Flannery, who would on occasion commit murders that Flannery had secured contracts for. The price was always $50,000, and Chris Flannery would actively tout for business in the criminal networks of Sydney, the Gold Coast and Melbourne. It was money, and that's what drove Chris. That was his demon, and that's what drove him in, in every respect. In criminal terms, had the opinion that he was a bigger-than-life personality, and it was important for him, for everyone to know that he was Chris Flannery, Mr Renderkill. Stephen Barron, former police detective turned forensic psychologist, believes Flannery's killing of Roger Wilson reveals the early work of a psychopath. Psychopaths don't have the emotional arousal, for example, anger that you and I would get. It may well have been he was simply asked to do a job. The job was this person had to die. Because it was probably his first or second murder, there's a good chance he was still acquiring the certain skills required to be an efficient Hitman. Well, Flannery, the committed murderer, would have uh, already played the whole thing through as a movie. 
so that he just uh, steps into the real life situation and uh, cold-bloodedly, ruthlessly, with no remorse and no sense of guilt, acts it out. Now, in his mind would be a huge hit of uh, dopamine, um, the, the endorphin that uh, floods a gambler when he wins, or, or floods somebody in love, even. Um, that real sense of, I have the power. With the police closing in over the Wilson murder, Flannery and his wife, Kath, reacted by conducting a media interview, denying all allegations. It was being rumoured that you had been retained as a hitman. Oh, that's incredible. It's just rubbish. You have heard these, though? Yes, I have. And what's, what's your answer to it's that? It's just ridiculous. Totally untrue. Can you tell us how you came to be connected with Mark Clarkson and with Roger Wilson? Well, Mr Clarkson uh, gave us some advice uh, on a business nature through a discotheque that we, had, we were having sort of trouble with. And uh, he came to advise us. And we had a meeting and Mr Wilson turned up at a meeting. And that's the only time I've seen Mr Wilson. Despite his denials, the evidence against Flannery was mounting. A detective, Brian Murphy, who was also part of that, uh, that Mickey Tisco scene, had um, uh, warned homicide this was going to happen. He'd heard there was a plot to kill Wilson. He'd heard them muttering around the, the corners in, in Mickey's disco. I rang the homicide and they said, well, have you got a body? And I said, no. I said, you've got to be fucking joking. And he said, no, I'm not, actually. He says, but uh, when you get a body, you ring us. So the murder went off. And, he, and, um, and there was uh, obviously some information went out where the body was buried. Um, so uh, Flannery being a, a barrier of bodies rather than a, you know, drop them at sea or whatever, uh, the body was still there. Flannery approached Alphonse Gangitano, an up-and-comer in the Melbourne crime scene, to do some very dirty work on his behalf. It was up to Gangitano and one or two others. They were sent out there to where this body was buried. They, uh, they dug it up, it must have been a grisly job of itself, and, uh, and reburied it in another spot. And it's, um, Gangitano told people later that that was the, the most disgusting thing he'd ever done in his life. Wilson's body has never been found, but police believe they had enough evidence to proceed with a prosecution. Chris Flannery, Mark Clarkson, and Kevin Williams were charged with the murder of Roger Wilson. The three men uh, were tried in the Supreme Court in Victoria. It was, at the time, the longest trial in Victorian criminal history. But the crucial Crown witness, Deborah Boundy, disappeared. She had overheard a conversation between Chris Flannery and her boyfriend, Kevin Williams, describing the murder of Wilson in detail. She is believed to have been killed at Flannery's orders alone. Without her testimony, the Crown case collapsed and the three men were acquitted. Flannery was free to kill again. Chris Flannery was born in 1948 and grew up on a tough patch in the working class Melbourne suburb of Brunswick. His father Edward was unable to hold down a job, drank heavily and was abusive to his wife and children. When Flannery was just nine, his father left the family home never to return, leaving Flannery and his two older siblings with their mother. Emily and Flannery's maternal grandmother Mary. Flannery despised his father for leaving his mother high and dry, but Edward Jr and Louise managed to overcome their hardships to become positive contributors to society. However, Chris drifted into a life of crime. Why was it that Chris, the youngest of the Flannery brood, shunned society so spectacularly? There is no doubt that, that Flannery had some exposure to neglect and abuse. But I'm kind of curious whether his father had the range of parenting skills that most fathers had at that time. Two, nature versus nurture. I think it's nature versus nurture versus choice. And it's an interactive process. What makes people bad? And why do siblings in the same family exposed to the same environment turn out not bad? And I guess the answer there is, the siblings are often protected by their age, their gender, they process their experiences slightly differently and they see the abuse and neglect in terms of another context. Dad's authoritarian, Dad's strict, Dad's loving but can't show it to me. I think Flannery had an abusive childhood. I, I led to believe that Brunswick was a difficult area to grow up in and I think the experience at Morningstar Reformatory may well have made Chris Flannery the man he later became. Flannery was only 14 when he was sent to Morningstar 
for break and enter and car theft. One man who can shed light on his time there is Flannery friend, former prison inmate turned author and playwright, Ray Mooney. I met Chris first in prison uh, around about 1968, and it was through his experiences in prison that I got to know about his experiences in Morningstar. He sent to Morningstar, I think when he was about 14, and what he told me was that it was one of those institutions where it was a pretty tough place, run by Franciscan friars in a beautiful old building, but they were as tough as nuts in terms of their attitude to reforming the kids who are under their care and they were quite ferocious in the way they went about that. And Chris was one of those kids who was a cheeky kid, he was a charismatic kid, he was a tough kid, he was an in-your-face in kid, but he was also a very good-looking kid, which made him quite vulnerable at the age of 14. He'd been abused in three separate ways. He'd been abused physically, he'd been abused psychologically, and it's my opinion that he was abused sexually. He never said it, but, but I knew. One of the side effects of putting teenagers into prisons or prison-like institutions is that they model, they copy all of that bad stuff, how to break boundaries, how to be a criminal, as opposed to somebody who stays in a loving family where they're constantly being reminded and reinforced for good behaviours. The die was cast somewhere in the rough and tumble streets of Brunswick and at Morning Star. At just 19 years of age, and with a criminal record as long as your arm, Flannery was sentenced to nine years for a string of offences, including rape. He entered the gates of Penfridge Prison in Melbourne with a smouldering resentment towards male authority figures. He then quickly found himself in a living hell, a place reserved for the worst of the worst, H Division. Scum. Stand to attention, scum. To oh. attention! Prisoner 363598? Yes, sir. I'm not a sir. They offered me a knighthood once, but I knocked it back. I'm your governor. Welcome to H Division. I think we're going to enjoy having you around. Has uh, 363598 been strip searched? No, governor. Drop and blossom. Have an up here, Governor. Well, let's just be certain, shall we? I've seen shit like you come and go. <clears throat> Get this through your head. I run this show. You might have been a big wig out there, son, but you're just a shitty number to me. Fuck you. In your dreams, 363598. <clears throat> Perhaps I could call the editor of The Age for you. Put him in next to Reed. They deserve each other. Conditions in Age Division were pretty bad. The only thing I let you do was live. And that's uh, underplaying it. It was as bad as it comes. Uh, it wasn't as bad for me as it was for Chris. They chose the people who worked in Age Division on the disposition of their psychological attitude and their size. They were incredibly large, ferocious prison officers who loved their job. Chris said that they broke him. And by broke him, what I mean is that he agreed to the conditions that they let you survive in H Division. In other words, you quick marched, you never looked up, you always looked down at the ground, you never looked at a prison officer, you uh, saluted, you did everything that you were told to do. They broke him in that he acquiesced to their rules and regulations. It was a hideous place, a 19th century style prison where prisoners would literally break rocks. That was their task for the day. After seeing a good friend rush to hospital as a result of another brutal beating from H Division guards, Flannery decided to fight back. He took them all on, offered all the screws to fight him one out, which they wouldn't, of course. Um, and they flogged him again and what have you, and he, and, he threat and he refused to obey any orders. In an act of defiance, Flannery stripped off his clothes and went on a hunger strike. 
This moment was detailed in a screenplay written by Ray Mooney for the film Every Night, Every Night. You can all get fucked. Do it on me fucking own. I'm no longer part of your fucking system. I've resigned. I'm free. You hear that, dish lickers? I'm free! News of the protest found its way into the media. You just wait till the press hears about this. They'll love it. This led to a Victorian parliamentary inquiry and ultimately the release of the Jenkinson Report, which found conditions in H Division barbaric. In the wake of these findings, some of the more sadistic guards were pensioned off and conditions improved. So Flannery, because he stood up to the authorities in H, became a hero to to, uh, to many prisoners at the time. When somebody goes into an institution where they're totally powerless and they are tortured and abused, they really lose sense of their ability to make things in their world happen. Then when Flannery very cleverly came up with this plan to go on a hunger strike, he was taking control. And that's what he thrived most on. Chris Flannery left Pentridge Prison having served five years of his nine-year sentence. He fell into the arms of Kathleen, a young woman with a child from a previous relationship. Chris and Kath had met years earlier, but his time in jail had put their relationship on hold. Towards the end of his incarceration, Kath wrote frequently to Flannery, and within six months of his release, they were married. The newlywed Flannery found employment as a bouncer at Mickey's Disco, a Melbourne nightclub. The nightclub was a gathering place for many underworld figures of the day, and Flannery quickly found his way back into crime. The only problem was he wasn't very good at it. He was arrested for possession of a pistol at Mickey's in 1974, and though he escaped a jail sentence, six months later, he was arrested and charged for an armed robbery. He absconded while on bail and fled to Perth. And while on the run, Flannery found the only gainful employment of his life, working at the menswear counter at David Jones in Perth, a job that suited the vain killer down to the ground. He was in love with Italian um, haute couture, you know, he, that was his thing. He loved the ties, the silk, um, you know, the threads were, that was his world. He thought the better he looked, the better he felt. And he used to dress beautifully, but he smelt like a whore's handbag. You know, he had five different colognes on at once and you couldn't get within 15 feet of him. If you had asthma, he'd kill you without a gun. It's a great story that he was uh, employed by David Jones in Perth, running the menswear counter there. In fact, he was so good at it that they promoted him. He didn't last all that long. He absconded on bail uh, from Victoria at the time. He knew he was hot, so he had to give up his job as uh, manager of the menswear section at David Jones in Perth. And he went back there the next day and robbed the place with an accomplice. Shot a guard while he was there. Roger Rogerson, then a detective with the New South Wales Police, received a tip off from West Australian Police that Flannery had fled to New South Wales. Rogerson knew that Flannery had sent a cache of weapons to a suburban railway station in Sydney. A stakeout was organised and Rogerson and the armed robbery squad lay in wait for Flannery's arrival. So on the day in question, I was there with some, some other detectives and the, the first person we met was Mrs Flannery. And she put her head into the office and uh, it was very nice and, and, and saying, look, I'm here to collect a box. And of course, the guys came in and, and then these blokes realised that they were trapped. I mean, these blokes were incredibly towy. And we've described Flannery as being obviously a psycho. Well, then, of course, it, it developed into a, a free-for-all. And I went up down on the, on the railway tracks with Flannery and uh, finally got over the top of him and got some handcuffs on him and they took him back to the CIB. He was taken back to be questioned. They're in a room where there's about six detectives. They take the handcuffs off Chris and Chris attacks them straight away, he breaks the jaw of one of the top detectives there. Here's a guy who is one out, surrounded by police. He's just been given a flogging on the way in and he takes them all on, attacks the main guy, Rogerson's there, sees it. Knows that there's something with, that this guy's got that very few people have got. 
Back in jail for another three years, Flannery decided he needed a change of occupation. He had one moment and then he pulled aside his old mate, Alan Williams. And he told Williams, he said, look, I'm no good at this. I'm no good at crime. I think what I'm going to do is kill people for a living. And that's pretty much how Rent a Kill Incorporated started. It was a murder for hire business designed by Flannery because he was no good at anything else. But looking at his background, it may well be he saw a prison full of people who'd committed crimes like drugs and, and street crimes that were very unsuccessful, hence they were in jail. And because prisons contain so few murderers, Flannery may well have decided that murdering people was a lot less risky in relation to being caught, convicted and going back to jail. Flannery is just 24 years old when he decided to become a gun for hire. Christopher Dale Flannery married Kathleen Egan in April 1978. Kath came from tough stock. She could handle Chris easily, and she was a doting wife and mother. Have a word to the kids about leaving their toys lying around. It's fucking dangerous. Christ, where's my bag? Right. What time are you behind? I don't know. Late. Why late? <sighs> Call me. Yes, all right, I will. Darling. What now? Give us a kiss, will ya? Be good, darling. I'm the fucking best there is, baby. There's been intense speculation about Kath Flannery's role with Chris. What we certainly do know is that she provided the structure uh, and the organisation in his life that he would not have had otherwise. Psychopaths have traditionally um, very poor structure. They don't normally aspire to long-range goals, long-range planning. I don't think that, that Kath was probably involved planning the murders, but I think that she gave him the structure. She gave him the structure at home. She gave him the structure in terms of their relationship. So it may well be he learned from Kath how to plan, how to structure. Well, what could I say about Kath? She was certainly very loyal to him, I could say that. When we were out and about, if Chris was just there in our company, he was a pretty likeable type of a bloke, just one on one and you're having a drink. And as soon as she'd turn up, he'd change his attitude. He'd put on, you know, he'd sort of come this tougher attitude. So she really held a lot of the strings with him. And she picked and chose. She was always asking questions about people. One night she walked over to me and she said, uh, how many people have you killed? And I said, well, if I'd killed anyone, you'd be the last C I'd ever tell. The only person that I knew on this planet that Chris Flannery was afraid of was his wife, Kath. And, and he made that clear, poignantly clear, on numerous occasions. He wouldn't kick on after hours. He'd say, I've got to get home or she'll have my nuts. That was one of his sayings and he was, and he meant it. And I'm sure she would have, having met her. I've never seen anyone who was more in love than Kathy and Chris when they were young and not only when they were young, but forever. It was the closest bond that I've ever come across. They were infatuated with each other. It was genuine love. It was, um, it was a Romeo and Juliet style love. And I keep reading in that um, Kathy was uh, Mrs. Macbeth or what have you. And the truth of the matter is that it, you couldn't be, it couldn't be further from the truth. Chris protected Kathy at every possible level. They were just in love, totally in love. and. Um, and I think people underestimate the quality of that love when they, when they try and analyse that relationship. Kath was charged with being an accessory after the fact in the Wilson murder trial. When Flannery was acquitted, the charges against her were dropped. It seems Chris Flannery was in love and in fear of his wife at the same time. After walking free from court over the murder of Roger Wilson, Flannery was arrested within minutes and extradited to New South Wales to face another murder charge. While out on bail for that crime, Flannery openly touted for business in Sydney. For $50,000, he'd kill anyone. For $10,000, he'd bash people senseless. Rent-A-Kill Inc. was now open for business. Naturally, the underworld sat up and started taking notice. All the crooks in Sydney wanted to know who Flannery was 
and if his reputation as a killer had any basis. They quickly discovered that it did. He just hated the drug. He you know, hated the drug dealers. He hated them. He was old school. He was a dinosaur, and he hadn't woken up to the fact that, you know, drugs were the in thing, and you know, hitmen and bank robberies and twenty thousand dollar TAB robberies were the old thing. So Chris, you know, he didn't like that, and he didn't like Barry, and he didn't like that whole crew, the Sayers crew, Chubb, all of them. He didn't like any of them. So they had a falling out, and. I said, mate, this is going to turn nasty here. And he goes, oh, I don't give a rat's ass how nasty it's going to get. And he just walked up to him and he goes, why don't you pick six of your best blokes to come out in this car park? And Barry said, oh, fuck off, you know, like six blokes, what are you talking about? And Chris undoes his suit jacket and he just pulls it back like that and he's just got this snub nose 38 poked in his pants. And he goes, one, two, three, four, five, six. So anytime you're ready, boys. And he walked out into the car park and that whole pub emptied into as many cabs as they could and left. In the 10 years before 1985, the uh, drugs were taking over as the uh, rivers of cash that fueled crime. This was ruled over by two men publicly, George Freeman, Lenny McPherson, the little fella and the big fella and they're often called the team. The other person behind the scenes somewhat, but associated with them, was Stan the Man Smith. George Freeman gave him a job. Now, someone told me he was getting paying him six or 700 bucks a week, which back in those days wasn't bad dough for doing nothing. All he had to do was behave himself. And, and I don't think George ever asked him to do much at all. There's been rumors that, you know, he got him to stand over this person, stand over that person. I don't think George needed to do that. But, of course, Flannery was forever getting around, you know, uh, offering his services to kill people. It's been a good round for Michael, a good left for the head, a left into the body. World champion boxer Barry Michael became a target for Flannery. Underworld figure Ron Feeney requested the services of Rent-A-Kill after a business venture went sour. The next thing I know, I'm warned around town that uh, they'd brought up Christopher Dale Flannery to, uh, to, you know, put a contract on me. And Christopher Dale Flannery, uh, fortunately for me, turned around and said, Barry Michael, no way. He said, I was there the night he beat Frank Ropus. He said, I'm a fan of his, not interested. So he wasn't interested in the job, so that was good. My opinion of, of hitmen is, hired hitmen, is that I think they're gutless. I always have. I'm talking about people who kill for money. You know, it's the last resort. So my opinion of him wasn't very good. I'd class him as a toe cutter. In other words, he was a backstabber. He'd put one in your back, he'd, you know, he'd turn on you like a snake. Perhaps Flannery's most grisly crime was the double murder of Terence Basham and his de facto Susan Smith. Basham was a former painter and docker who Flannery had known from the old days in Melbourne. He had fallen out with his drug dealing mates who gave Flannery a call. And so Flannery turned up on Basham's doorstep. Mate, it's a beautiful place. You've done very well. Uh, yeah, cheers. Here she is. Cheers and kisses. Yeah, Chris. Christ, Terry. You've spawned, son. Sarah. Ah, she's a little beauty, mate. Yeah. Thank God she hasn't got your looks, eh? Huh. I live for her, mate. We both do. <sighs> we need to do a bit of business, mate. Yeah, I was wondering why you came all the way up here. I got some bad news for you, mate. Uh, Sue and I are pulling out. Would you make us a cup of tea, darling? White and two. Listen, I know you got this Colombian thing all working out. And, you know, under normal circumstances, I'd be right there with you. But uh, we've got the kid now, you know. And, uh, changes everything. Uh, white and two. Here's the thing, mate. Barry says you haven't retired. He says that you're branching out, doing business on your own. But yeah, Barry and I just had a little blue, you know, and it's nothing serious. I'll patch it up. What, so, so you're not retired? What? Not retired exactly, but no. You see, mate, I don't care either way. I, I mean, it's just business, you know, and... Chris, hey, mate. I've got a little kid now, huh? I got cash too. I got over a hundred thousand. So just 
Tell Barry it's all sweet and uh, I'll never cross his path again, I promise. And you got my word on it. But what sort of a bloke would I be? What sort of a businessman would I be if I doubted Barry? Do you see? Like, the customer's always right, Terry. And the customer wants you retired. I'm sorry, darling. It's just business. Now, there's plenty of room at the table, Terry. But you got greedy. Can't say I didn't look after you, mate. Come on. Come on. Do you know where Daddy keeps his money? Hey. Yeah. Uh, uh, there we go. There we go. Terence Basham was a former painter and docker, and he and his wife were actively involved in uh, the distribution of marijuana and heroin. They were operatives working for Barry Bull and other drug traffickers. They had decided to go out on their own. It's a very dangerous business. And Barry Bull contacted Chris Flannery and asked him to go and murder them for the price of $50,000. 39-year-old Terence Basham and his 30-year-old de facto wife Susan were in the lounge room of their home at Stoker's Siding on Friday night when someone came through their back door. The intruder shot both at point-blank range through the head and body. Their two-year-old daughter, Sarah, was left unharmed. I think the sociopath is uh, very capable of compartmentalising their mind. And so he might have thought, well, it's a child, so I'm not going to kill the child, but it's not a child that he can empathise with or feel the feelings of. So he can easily walk away and leave the child there with, with dead parents. When he walked away, the child was not a person to him. It was just part of him carrying out the code of commitment, I will not kill the child, but that child is nothing to me. I don't care. Abandoning a two-year-old girl after killing her parents was an appalling act. But Flannery would go a step further when he attempted to kill a serving New South Wales police officer. Undercover detective Michael Drury had been involved in a drug investigation which led to charges being laid against a drug dealer and mate of Flannery's, Alan Williams. Williams tried to buy himself out of trouble by attempting to bribe Drury. When that didn't work, he called on Flannery to kill him. Drury was shot twice in the kitchen of his Sydney home in front of his two-year-old daughter. On the verge of death, Drury made a statement that Roger Rogerson had offered the bribe on behalf of Williams. The shooting of a policeman was a crime that horrified the nation. Chris Flannery had well and truly crossed the line. This was a type of crime that was beyond the acceptable behaviour of people like Lanny McPherson and George Freeman. They would never interfere in this way with a police officer or families within the community. They would only interfere with other violent criminals. Alan Williams came before the Supreme Court in New South Wales on a charge of conspiracy to murder. And when the indictment was read out to him in court, in that Alan Williams conspired with Christopher Dale Flannery and Roger Carly Rogerson to murder Michael Patrick Drury. How did he plead? He pleaded guilty. When Mick Drury got shot, I was as shocked and stunned as anyone else. And had I had any information at all, uh, which would have had a bearing on it, I'd have been very happy to pass on to the police. Rogerson faced trial for the attempted bribery of Drury, but was acquitted. However, in July 1986, a police tribunal found Rogerson guilty of misconduct charges, and he was dismissed from the force. Flannery never had his day in court over the shooting of Drury, as he had disappeared by then. But Drury is certain of his guilt. I'm satisfied beyond all reasonable doubt. And I knew many years ago, shortly after I was shot, that Chris Flannery was the person who shot me at my house that evening. In 1985, Sydney streets were awash with blood. A new criminal outfit led by Barry McCann had commenced a war for control of Sydney's rackets. 
Three weeks into the new year, an attempt was made on Flannery's life. A car pulled up at Flannery's Arncliff home and shots were fired from a machine gun at Flannery and his family as they arrived home from a Sunday lunch. Christopher Flannery's Sydney house was peppered with bullets. They smashed through windows, splintered aluminium cladding and shattered brickwork. But of the 30 shots fired, only two found their target. To this day, no one knows who did it. Flannery believed Tom Domican was responsible, but there's nothing to suggest that. In the ensuing weeks, Flannery set about killing Domican. Shots were fired at him and his associate. Flannery had become unhinged. Whoever uh, used the armour light to try and kill Chris simultaneously meant to kill Kath because it was sprayed and they were both together. So whoever did that was out to get them both. Christine answers the door at the same time. So she's also there. So here's a young child, 12-year-old child, who's uh, being shot at potentially by an armalite. It changed the rules a little bit. Flannery took a wound in the ear, which was of no consequence except it deafened him for a time. The uh, wound in the webbing between his uh, thumb and his forefinger was very painful. He refused to be treated with painkilling drugs because he didn't want to be in a situation where he could get potentially get caught off guard. So therefore, he was suffering incredible pain all the time. The pain and the close call with Kath and his family made the already volatile Flannery more erratic. In many ways, he was the rather true sociopath. He had very little regard for the well-being of other people. He would often brag amongst other people of the crimes he'd been involved in over the years that went through the full spectrum to several murders, kidnappings, etc. I've seen him put shots in, gunshots into roofs of people's houses though, you know, because he didn't feel they were giving him enough respect. I've seen him threaten people that owed him money. Oh, one of uh, Flannery's more famous lines was, uh, you're not a koala bear, I can kill you. He'd say it to police officers, he'd say it to criminals, he'd say it to anyone in the street. Flannery seemed to have fallen for the trick of believing his own publicity. His violent temper had become even more lethal. He would lash out assaulting people who had once regarded him as a friend. No one was safe. So the doc says, what seems to be the problem? And the bloke goes, it hurts when I jerk off. <laughs> <laughs> What's that bastard up to? I don't know, just getting a drink. Prick. He always shows up empty-handed. That's my personal piece. He doesn't know, mate. I'll replace it. No. Fuck you. Chris. Chris! Hey! Chris! Hey! No! Chris! Oh, my <sighs> Next time he will his own piss. Hey! I had seen him explode on occasions. I've seen him break a guy's teeth with the muzzle of a gun. And I was sure he was going to shoot him right then and there. And he just grabbed this bloke by the hair, shoved him up against the wall of that theatre, and shoved this gun into his mouth so violently that it pushed all his teeth out and split his lip. And he was wide-eyed and absolutely off the planet. He could fight a bit. He just rather, he didn't. Uh, and that was because he didn't want to be scarred. He, he didn't like having facial scars or marks on him, so he'd rather King hit you or stick a gun in your face. Yeah, he was a very good-looking person who uh, didn't look as if he could fight, but a lot of people fell into Chris. Uh, he was a ferocious, uh, he was a ferocious fighter. In fact, he could have fought for Australia in the um, Octagon UFC. That's the type of fighter he was. We were in the Clovelly Hotel on a, I think it was a Thursday night actually, and um, Chris got into an altercation there with a bloke and his wife. And the girl um, threatened him with a stiletto, and he king hit this girl, and he hurt her quite badly. But he just lost his temper. He'd had too much to drink. He didn't like the bloke, and he clocked his wife. He started reaching for his gun, and I thought he was so drunk that he would shoot both of them, and so I just king hit him. And it wasn't just alcohol adding to the problem. Flannery had been taking cocaine at speed, most of his adult life, but in the last three months of his life, he was taking cocaine virtually 10, 20 times a day. He wasn't staying with his wife, Kath. He remained in contact with her, but for the most part, 
he was in deep cover. The drugs that he was taking would have surely made his mind um, quite, you know, adult. And all of those traumatisations, the beatings, starting right from when he was little, and the tortures in prison, would have made him a very irrational person. Flannery was now living in the shadows. His crimes, particularly the attempt on Michael Drury's life, were catching up with him. He spent his days wired on amphetamines, sleep deprived, moving from house to house. The walls were closing in. Flannery was caught in a maelstrom of his own making. George Freeman and his team, who had kept him on side, now feared him. They knew that Flannery's very presence stood in the way of establishing a lasting peace with the up-and-comers, McCann's gang. In February, Flannery's old mate from prison in Melbourne, Mick Sayers, was murdered by three gunmen outside his Bronte home. Flannery's only surviving friend in the Sydney scene was Tony Eustace, and Flannery shot him in an attempt to curry favour with Freeman. 42-year-old Anthony Eustace was about to get into his Mercedes outside the airport Hilton when the gunman opened fire. There were six shots from a 45 caliber handgun. Four hit Eustace in the chest. I think with the Eustace murder, what was obvious is that, to those in the know, is that Flannery did it. And, yet, and, and of course, it raised a question mark. Flannery was probably closer to Eustace than anyone else in Sydney. And if, if Eustace couldn't trust him, no one else could. I would say it would be a factor in them deciding, look, if, if he can shoot, shoot loose, Eustace, we better get rid of him. Chris Flannery told a number of people, if he was arrested for my shooting, he was going to roll over and tell the truth on everyone. And there were some significant organised crime figures that couldn't guarantee their own safety. By the time of his disappearance, there was a dispute, but on the one hand, between George Freeman and Lenny McPherson, and on the other, this group who I'll loosely describe as the McCann group. And Flannery was seen as an absolute pest and the, the catalyst for solving the differences between the two groups was to get rid of Flannery. I spoke with him in the last couple of months of his life. I'd visited him a couple of times. He was edgy basically about the police. He thought that they had locked him into the uh, Michael Jury shooting and he thought that there was an obligation on the police to back him up, to back up for what had happened to Michael Jury. By May 9th, 1985, Flannery was out of luck, out of friends, and out of time. He'd been hiding out at various places around Sydney when crime boss George Freeman tracked him down at an apartment at the Connaught building. According to Cass Flannery, George invited Chris over to test out a new machine pistol. Chris left the building and was never seen again. family raised the alarm last night when the 36-year-old ex-Melbourne crime figure failed to return from a business appointment. There are a number of theories. One is that he was taken to George Freeman's place, tortured on a billiard table before he was killed. Did you say he had nothing to do with his death? I had nothing. Is he dead? Well, I don't know. <laughs> is he dead? Police well, seem to think he might be. And that? Yeah. Well, I don't know that. There's been all sorts of conjecture as to uh, what happened to, to Chris Flannery. Ned Smith came up with a, with a story that, um, that I shot Chris Flannery right between the eyes and, and killed him. Rumours abound about how it happened, what happened, and everyone has their own two bobs worth on that. But um, once again, it was all over money. Probably would have still been alive, although giving Chris's penchant for guns, he probably would have got himself in the same pickle in another city. Other theories have Flannery escaping Sydney alive, and living under an assumed name. But the one person to survive a hit from Rent a Kill, Michael Drury, knows that Flannery is not the kind to live a quiet life. He was the type of fellow that, if he was living in any Australian town, even today, he would want to, within a week or two, be in charge of the chook raffles in the local pub. And every person would know he was in town. In criminal terms, 
had the opinion that he was a bigger than life personality. And it was important for him, for everyone to know that he was Chris Flannery, Mr. Rent-A-Kill. A coronial inquest lasting five years took evidence from over 400 witnesses, but could only conclude Chris Flannery was murdered by a person or persons unknown on or around the date of May 9, 1985. Just who did it has remained one of the great mysteries of Australian criminal history until today. Recently, a significant player in the Chris Flannery story has revealed that Flannery was murdered in or around George Freeman's home the day he disappeared, and that his killer was Stan the Man Smith. This program has checked into this account with a number of other sources who have agreed that Smith was indeed Flannery's killer. Stan Smith was a significant criminal figure in Australia who trafficked in drugs. Yet he was old school, a friend of both George Freeman and Lenny McPherson. And when some dirty work was required, Stan Smith could always be called upon to do the business. He is believed to have killed more than a dozen criminals, those like Flannery that stepped out of line and threatened the livelihoods of the established criminal network. The powers that be in Sydney decided that Christopher Flannery should go for the sake of peace. In a funny kind of way, the man who killed for a living was himself sacrificed so that the business of crime could go on.